Welcome to Expert Chat, the webinar put together by On Frontiers, the accelerated learning development company that is promoting information sharing and knowledge across frontier and emerging markets. On Frontiers is sponsoring the African Utility Week, which is a, it's a conference that's hard to describe the enormity of it. It brings together 7,000 people to Cape Town covering and it's been going for 18 years now and we're broadcasting here from the ministerial room in the Cape Town International Convention Center. And I'm delighted to have a panel here of experts that we've pulled out from the conference uh, to give you a snapshot within half an hour of some of the discussions, some of the topics that are being talked about right here. So to begin with, I've got uh, Chris Trimble here from the World Bank and he is a senior energy specialist for the World Bank's energy and extractive global practice. We have Mamadou Bitai, who is managing director for the Rockefeller Foundation's uh, Africa office. And we have Kathy Oxby, who is the commercial director for Africa Green Co. And Africa Green Co, for anyone that doesn't know it, is a conduit between uh, or an enabler between producers of renewable energy in Africa and the much larger utilities that those renewable suppliers hope to attract. I'm Gavin Sirk and I'm Editorial Director for On Frontiers and I'll be channeling your questions here today. So I've got lots of questions from the participants who have already registered, uh, but we aim to keep this interactive. So please do send in your posts, send in your thoughts, your questions as we're going along uh, when issues uh, interest you. So I want to start with some facts really that Mamadou you mentioned in your address earlier which is just to really set the scene for energy in Africa. According to the World Energy Outlook an estimated 1.2 billion people, that's 16% of the global population, lack access to electricity and of those 80% are in rural areas in sub-Saharan Africa and developing Asia. At its core, this is an issue of financing, right? This is about uh, mismatching of you know, reward versus risk. And really, there'd be more money coming in if only there wasn't the perception that there's so much risk attached. So I want to start by asking, how do we de-risk energy in Africa? Chris, if I can start with you. Sure. So, yeah, that's a great question and certainly a topic of a lot of discussion. You know, the one of the kickoff session this morning, we heard about if we want to close the access gap, we need to move from talking about billions of investments to trillions of investments. And it's clear that's not going to come from public sector. There's a critical role for private sector to come in. But as you mentioned, it's extremely difficult when the current climate for uh, for private sector to come in. There's such huge risk associated with the investments. One of the major uh, issues that we're most focused on is the financial viability of utilities. Uh, we actually just uh, launched a study uh, looking at exactly this issue, first of its kind across the whole continent. And actually, if you look at across 39 uh, countries that we looked at, only two are, are, are covering all their costs. Okay. So in that context, it's extremely difficult, not only to maintain assets, but also to expand. Okay, and that is the report, Making Power Affordable for Africa and Viable for Its Utilities uh, from the World Bank. Uh, Mamadou, please, uh, from your perspective. Yes, I think that uh, the risking the sector will come from, maybe from my perspective, two areas. One is uh, through policies. How do you create uh, an enabling environment? where actually investors, because if this needs to be addressed, you need to bring in private sector capital, because for a long time, governments have taken this task on their own shoulders, and we know what uh, the, the shortcoming is. So they need to enable, uh, through sound policies, uh, increased investment. Second is really through financing mechanism. Uh, we talk a lot about blended finance, uh, and we at the Rockefeller Foundation um, have the flexibility to deploy our philanthropic capital in those types of arrangements uh, through per program related investments, a combination of short term grants uh, with clear outcome indicators to actually guarantees. And uh, this is something that we have been deploying uh, to work with different uh, uh, projects. Uh, that would aim to set examples on how you can mobilize PPPs 
to 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 address the the electricity access gap. Okay, okay. Thanks. And Kathy, from Africa Green Co's perspective. Yes, thanks, Gavin. I mean, Africa Green Co was really set up to address these very issues, to looking at how to to mitigate some of the key risks associated with investment in the African power sector in a more practical and coordinated fashion than some of the, the efforts to date. Um, I think you know, the numbers you, you quoted speak for themselves. Um, and you know, against the, the backdrop that Chris highlighted of the current lack of creditworthy off-takers in the form of the national utilities, um, we, we need to develop a, a transition um, alongside working with the utilities to, to help them reach creditworthiness, because ultimately that, you know, that's the only way the market will be sustainable. Um, and so after the Africa Green Co proposition is in order to, to create that stepping stone and mitigate the risks and attract the private sector capital to do the projects, we can create a creditworthy intermediary off taker. So reducing the credit risk profile at the project level in order to attract more private sector capital from wider sources and at lower cost, which translates into a lower tariff, um, which can be passed through then to the utilities, which then helps the utilities close the gap between their wholesale um, prices that they're having to pay and the retail tariffs they're charging. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process, it's an evolutionary process um, to, to tap into the private sector capital to get more generation built, to reduce the tariffs and ultimately lead towards a more liquid market um, and, uh, and assist in the utilities um, for the longer term sort of attaining that, that level of creditworthiness. Okay, and, uh, and we're here, as I said, at African Utility Week and you can see some of the stools, some of the names behind us uh, in the exhibition, and I apologize for the blurring, by the way, it's that exhibition that uh, seems to be taking a lot of the camera focus away from these fine panelists. Uh, but a lot of the people that we've seen today are from a mix of sectors. You've got private sector, public sector, you've got the multilaterals. Um, Mamadou, from Rockefeller's perspective, how are the different sectors doing? You know, how is the public sector, private sector, multilaterals, you know, is it, is it is cooperation working well actually uh, uh, i think that this is a really a uh, non going process uh, i think that if we were where we should be then uh, things would be different but i think that what we can say is that all these stakeholders actually have a strong will and uh, are, are trying to 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 come together bringing each uh, what uh, their uh, distinctive uh, actually capability uh, is uh, together to, to try to address these issues. So we're noting a number of uh, those uh, uh, projects or, or collaborative uh, uh, approaches uh, that actually are bringing together something like uh, Africa Green Co or others uh, such as uh, uh, the Smart Power for Rural Development in India, etc., where you see really a collaboration between uh, not-for-profit uh, government, but also private sector investors actually to bring solutions that can address the issue. So yes, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Chris, I want you to be honest now, uh, are multilaterals doing enough? I mean, uh, yeah, there's, a, there's obviously a constraint on the the, the, wind, the financing window that's available from uh, from concessional financiers like the bank and others. You know, I think in the grand scheme of things, they're probably if we really if we really want to close the gap, they're only going to be able to meet five or ten percent of the of the needs. And it's you know you need to be careful to choose how that financing is used because it's very uh, valuable resources. So you know where the private sector can play a role that that should be uh, identified those those opportunities. So far, it's mainly been in generation. Uh, you know, starting to look at uh, transmission and and uh, there's been some examples of distribution. But uh, I think from an access perspective, public financing is where uh, is going to be the most valuable uh, asset because we have a tension between trying to achieve viability of utilities, but uh, doing a real electrification is not something that's going to help the improve the financial position of a company of utility so there's a role there for the public sector to come in and, and kind of finance that capex the upfront investment and that can be handed over to the utility to actually manage but uh there's a so so that's an example of how to choose you know well-directed and uh, focused public sector investments okay kathy um one of the questions that we've had from a few participants is how african cities which are you know some of them are developing very fast are doing in terms of energy efficiency infrastructure. Do you have a perspective on that? I need you to take the mic before my arm drops off. 
Sure. Um, I'm, I'm probably not the best qualified to comment on how well the cities are, are currently doing on energy efficiency. I think our focus is more on the sort of new on-grid generation um, capacity. Um, I mean, obviously, any efforts to improve efficiency um, you know, save that vital power and ensure that it, it, it can be used best to stimulate economic development that we're all trying to achieve. But uh, perhaps um, I, I might hand over to the other panelists to, to answer that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, we often talk about the, the least cost uh, power development plan for a country and uh, often the cheapest way to get your extra megawatt is through demand efficiency. So there's some very easy kind of quick wins. You know, the, the technology now we have, for example, with LED bulbs, the, the wattage that they draw is significantly, you know, 10 20 percent of a traditional incandescent bulb so right overnight if you just switch out all the let's say street lights and uh, government offices with from incandescent into led bulbs you immediately re reduce the load and that could be substantial you know five ten percent of a load reduction which you know for uh, for countries that are struggling with power uh, supply that could be a big difference okay and mamadou where any thoughts on where that's working and perhaps you know where it's not working so well well, probably what I would like to add is just in terms of efficiency, one of the things that we're seeing, particularly with our partner, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, starts first by having the right mix of energy sources. Uh, oftentimes, uh, countries, in, including and cities are part of those countries, actually, uh, have a lot of commitments on uh, uh, perhaps not the right or the most efficient or the most uh, actually not cheapest, but uh, financially more efficient uh, uh, commitments in terms of power generation. So this is why actually a number of projects are happening right now, uh, really looking at how do you help countries actually design blueprints uh, that would give them actually the best uh, plan in terms of bringing different energy sources, uh, on-grid, off-grid solutions, and uh, where they make sense, uh, whether it is cities, uh, rural areas, etc. And this helped them actually uh, not just overcommit uh, to larger amount of power that they don't need, which cost them to, to a very a lot of uh, uh, money, which is very expensive, and in the end actually the country is not necessarily uh, covered. So, so that's really something that uh, uh, we're doing with uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute and helping African countries with. Okay, and Cathy, you got off that last question very nicely. Uh, <laughs> but I want to ask you one that I think plays more to where you are, which is power pools. And, you know, the, the, a lot of the frustration is that power pools simply aren't large enough because they're in individual countries. And, you know, part of the process for encouraging more energy, energy trading would be to uh, allow energy trading to go cross-border more where are we on that? Where are we on cross-border trading? Thank you. Um, yes, so I, mean, I think there is a general under-recognition of the power pools. Um, the way that new generation capacity is currently built um, by the private sector under IPPs um, is on the basis of long-term bilateral contracts with generally the national utility as an off-taker. Um, in all, it's, they're generally project finance deals, and so the the revenue stream under that power purchase agreement for 20 years, 25 years, however long, um, needs to be sufficiently certain that the project can raise debt on the back of it. Um, and in case there's a, an issue, if there's a default under that agreement, um, th that re generally leads to a termination of that arrangement and the government having to step in and pay a termination buyout price to repay debt and equity um, and that the contingent liability associated with that government liability um, in case of default is a massive burden on the sovereign balance sheet. So what we're trying to do is move away from that model and recognize that there are power pools. The Southern African power pool is the most developed currently um, within Africa um, but the, the West African power pool is, is developing fast. They've recently um, drafted market rules to, to start doing um, competitive trading. And in terms of interconnection within the pool, there are 14 members of the West African Power Pool who should all be interconnected by 2019. Southern African Power Pool, there are 12 mainland members, nine are currently interconnected, 
and um, and the other three there are plans to interconnect so you know the purples exist they are regional um, and part of the role we see for, for Africa Greenco is helping to stimulate the trade on these purples and ultimately you know we want to move to a position where you know, like, like Europe where you have a, a merchant power market and rather than projects being funded on the back of a long-term power purchase agreement which requires a government guarantee and often then further gold plated through um, support from the World Bank Group or the African Development Bank. If, we, if the market is sufficiently deep and liquid, the market can be the, the, either the, the primary off taker or at least the backstop, um, such that these, these massive contingent liabilities aren't um, burdening the governments and then that, that frees up capacity for the governments to focus on other areas such as Chris highlighted, the areas that the private sector can't do or, or much harder for the private sector to do in terms of the, the, the underlying transmission infrastructure or the, the energy access, the, the sort of non-profitable areas. So um, developing the power pools is really key to, um, to the market evolving to a point um, which, which benefits everybody. It gets more power, it reduces reliance on um, government support um, and mobilizes more private sector capital. Okay, and Chris, uh, you'll have to talk about the noise now because we've got some music coming through from the uh, conference downstairs. Uh, but Chris, what's your perspective from the World Bank and particularly what Cathy was saying about getting to the level where Europe is? How long will that take for Africa? Well, I'd say it's something I'm actually really optimistic about, I have to say. You know, one interesting thing about uh, the continent of Africa is that although there are extremely large deficits today in terms of energy production, there's huge potential there. And uh, this is the vision behind power pools. It's been a vision that's uh, well known for the last 20, 30 years, but not very well realized outside of uh, SAPP. But, uh, you know, in the last year, there's been some huge developments. I, I work mainly in West Africa, and there there have been two, two projects that have reached financial close, uh, CLSG and the OMBG. These are really large projects. For example, OMBG is, you know, it's a $750 million project, 1,600 kilometers of transmission line that will allow countries to trade electricity. And that's a, that's a fantastic opportunity because you have, at the moment, you have the likes of Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau producing electricity at 25, 30, 35 cents a kilowatt hour, yet they could buy it from Guinea for 10 or 12 cents a kilowatt hour. That's a fundamental change in the cost structure of their utility and helps them move towards a viable, you know, a viable operation. So even though these projects have been envisioned for a long time, it's only now that we have actual financial close, all the money's on the table, contracts are signed and construction's about to start. So it's very exciting. And I think in the next few years, you're going to see massive changes in, in the cost structures of many utilities in West Africa. Okay, and, and a related question, Mamadou, from, from Rockefeller's perspective. I mean, one, one of the great challenges that, and one of the great opportunities that we've seen is the, is the falling cost of solar. And, you know, a lot of... Um, uh, smaller uh, recycled uh, solar plants that are, that are starting up in Africa. How do you see that integrating with national grids? What, what's, what's the development look like in terms of the smaller solar projects with larger grids? Okay, no, I think that uh, one thing to say is that despite all the efforts and new investment and arrangements that were mentioned earlier, it will take still time. Uh, for the grid to reach everyone. So uh, that's where actually the smaller uh, options such as mini grids comes in uh, to actually fast track uh, that access uh, to for, for, for those who are left out uh, and supplement the grid. And uh, the idea is that uh, these uh, off-grid solutions, mini, mini grids actually, uh, uh, over time, uh, where the grid reaches actually can be interconnected. Uh, but uh, now there is a lot of dynamism in the, in the sector, but there is still uh, some challenges uh, related to, to, to policy, uh, related to leveling uh, the playing field, because you have uh, many uh, uh, actors that actually operate in different ways. So some regulation needs to be there. But actually, there are also challenges around financing them, uh, not enough facilities to support them initially. Uh, and uh, also, there are some issues around uh, actually their financial viability today, because uh, many of them are not subsidized. But oftentimes, the subsidies to the grid itself is very high and costly to governments, but maybe there are things that can be done there uh, by governments and others actually to stimulate that investment uh, to uh, fast track the access.
Okay, we've got a question in from John. Thank you, John, who asks, how and where do you see the biggest opportunities in microgrids and other distributed energy? Um, <laughs> the, uh, that, that's just flipped up on me. Uh, uh, so I'll repeat from John, how and where do you see the biggest opportunities with microgrids and other distributed energy resources? So I don't know who wants to take that question. Kathy, maybe? So our focus isn't isn't on the uh, the sort of the off grid mini grid um, <laughs> solutions. I mean, I think the the whole the concept behind the diversified generation is it can be all over the place yeah, in terms of energy access. It's a crucial part of the jigsaw, um, and the uh, and looking at renewable energy. You know, Africa is very um, well endowed with with wind, with solar, with hydro, and it's a question of using those resources where you find them. And I think it also, yeah, so moving away from slightly from the off-grid question onto the on-grid um, applicability as well, and the use of the power pools, um, being able to tap into the, the richness of the African renewables um, fully and for, for really fulfill that potential and, and have the maximum impact on, on getting to lowest cost generation depends on moving power around the region. Um, through the power pools. You know, some regions have sun, some have wind, some have hydro, and until those resources are shared throughout the region, um, you, you won't be able to bring the, the powers down as much as possible. Um, I'm going to move on because we've got a couple more questions coming through that I want to get through. So a uh, question from Lubim, and I'm sorry for that pronunciation if that's a bit off, but Lubim, but um, Maybe one for Chris or Mamadou, government liabilities stem from the simple truth. They have no money and no discipline to keep up with payments. Why will merchant model all of a sudden fix that? Especially if, there's, if the very same utilities have to buy electricity in the market. Yeah, I mean, uh, the government, uh, if I understand the question correctly, it's looking at the government uh, payment of, of uh, electricity. Is that the... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's a big issue around uh, collection from governments, a big issue around, uh, around the continent. We see, it, we see that in many places. But, there, I mean, there are some solutions to help improve collection rates uh, from government entities. Uh, one is uh, looking at performance contracts between the government and, uh, and utilities. That the, if, the, you know, if the utility commits to making certain performance targets, the government will, will ensure that the uh, payments are made adequately. Another mechanism is, is on the demand management side, like we mentioned, if you can help do things like I mentioned with producing bulbs, you, know, you can help actually reduce the consumption from government entities and that can help uh, um, uh, you know, reduce the collection losses from, from government entities. But uh, no, it is, it's a major issue that we see across the continent and very often the government is one of the major consumers. Hmm. Well, maybe got to. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one too. Um, so, and the, yeah, there, there are a number of issues. The, you know, the government has some, some serious constraints around um, FX exposure as well. And one of the, the key uh, sort of creators of, of the problem of the, the inability um, to service some of the, the payment obligations under PPAs is, is movements in, in, in FX. If the, the PPAs are denominated in hard currency and the, um, the customers are all paying local currency, then it's the it's the national utility and then ultimately the government taking the risk on on that foreign exchange exposure, um, and so you know, I think it's key to to cracking that. And you know, one way to do that is to create structures which will mobilise local capital, local currency capital, um, to to invest in the projects, such that the the PPAs, the power purchase agreements, can move to being denominated in local currency and eliminating. Um, that mismatch. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's right to to always sort of you know, blame the government for you know intentionally not paying or you know it's it's not it's not necessarily a, um, a sort of a, a bad behaviour. You know, they're under extreme pressure. Um, the move towards cost reflective tariffs, you know, is also key. Um, and you know, the governments and regulators, I think, you know, increasingly acknowledge and agree that they need to charge cost reflective tariffs, um, despite the political sensitivity around that. Um, because subsidizing the, the end user tariffs is subsidizing those who have access to power, not those who don't. So arguably you're subsidizing the wrong portion of the population. 
Um, and um, yeah, that's probably uh, probably enough for now. <laughs> okay, so Mamadou, I don't know if you want to come back on that or if we should move on, but um, one of the uh, questions has, that we've had from several participants is around the recycling of waste into energy. And there's been a lot of focus from projects on this kind of area from, um, from uh, waste plants that grow in water, such as hyacinths, to, to other kind of energy projects. Um, some of that's pretty inspiring. I mean, I don't know what, what your thoughts are and who wants to have a, have a little discussion on that. <laughs> I'm certainly no expert on the subject, but um, you know, I think harnessing whatever energy sources are available um, on a renewable basis and you know, it, converting waste to energy is obviously a fantastic uh, proposition. And I think there's, there's some fantastic projects based around the sugarcane industry um, where you know, they, they produce um, biofuels uh, out of like, sort of crushing the sugarcane and then they also produce sugar. And then the waste product, the, the bagas, it can then be used as a fuel um, for generation projects. So um, you know, I think the, the potential there uh, is absolutely enormous and, and these sort of synergies um, really you know, do need to be harnessed and there are lots of people looking at innovative ways to, to maximise the use of, um, of this energy filled waste. Okay. Just one brief point of add on that. I mean, the, the, today, the energy, in terms of energy mix that we see today in Africa, it's very, very small. Is uh, this kind of uh, waste to energy as a proportion is less than probably, I know it's less than one percent, probably even less than zero point one percent. So it's very, very small. But I think that the the there are opportunities there. But I think that the key point in, in most countries is to have a, a least cost power development plan to show the path to for, for the expansion of the sector and and for the for the government and the utility to commit to following that plan uh, so that you minimize the cost in the utility very often what you see is uh, that's not planned and there's maybe kind of a chaos where PPAs are signed maybe not in the best deal for the for the country and that ends up translating into higher costs and higher tariffs for the end consumer okay we've got three minutes and three questions so I know Mamadou wanted to come back on something but I'm gonna to need to move on because uh, questions are coming through fast and furious from the participants uh, from Takeli uh, and again my apologies if I mispronounced that how do you see the opportunity of biogas energy in rural Africa where livestock population and pastoral way of life is common well, uh, I think that uh, biogas, like uh, the question you talked about early, waste to energy uh, and other type of sources are really an opportunity. But I think that one of the challenges that will come again is the issue of financing, because uh, this uh, actually to take them to the required scale uh, to make a difference and really contribute to access to energy, uh, it needs to be uh, sort of affordable. Many of these are very innovative technology, yet very costly uh, for, 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 for investment and to be made uh, commercially viable yet. Uh, but I, I think that there is a huge opportunity there. Okay, and, and probably one to Kathy here, I think. Do you think Africa, and this is from Orhun, by the way, do you think African power pools will suffer from too much renewable penetration, i.e. too low prices to attract investment, similar to what we're seeing in the EU markets? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think we're, we're way off from that for now, but it's certainly a risk around how the, the market develops and how um, what the priority that renewables are given on the grid. Um, and the, the Southern African Power Pool, taking that as, as an example, I think the, sort of the key is to, to using renewable resources um, in as um, complementary a way as possible. Um, the region has a lot of hydro, which can be used just as dispatchable uh, power to balance the intermittent generation from solar and wind. So really, I'd say the key is ensuring that you don't have too much intermittent generation to balance um, so that you don't end up with, with enormous peaks and troughs as enormous volumes of, of intermittent um, flick on and off. Okay, thanks. And one to Chris, I think from, I'm going to really mess this up, Kutua. Could you describe the best incentive measures to boost renewable energy in developing African countries? Best incentive measures? You've got less than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, the... 
I think an important part of, I mean, I'm not sure it's an incentive, but an important process to follow is, uh, I think, making sure that there's competitive, competitive tenders for, for renewal projects. We've seen uh, consistently that the prices are much lower when you run a competitive process, which again translates to lower prices for the end consumer and lower costs for the, for the uh, utility. Okay, we're, we're just about out of time, unfortunately, but I, I want to thank our panel, Chris Trimble from the World Bank, Mamad Mamadou Bitai from Rockefeller Foundation, and Kathy Oxby from Africa Green Co. Thanks for a fascinating panel discussion. Uh, we're back on the 6th of June, where we'll have Jerome Booth, who many people will know as the founder, co-founder rather, of Ashmore, one of the most successful emerging markets companies in, uh, in the London investment firm arena. Um, since found, co-founding Ashmore, Jerome has moved on to founding New Sparta, which has a range of different companies attract, uh, attached to it, some in investment, New Sparta Asset Management, some in energy, and others in areas such as telecoms and media. Um, Jerome Booth will be joining us at the same time, 11.30 New York, 4.30 in London. Um, so hope to see you there. There were a lot more questions than we've managed to get through. So I'm hoping what our panel will do is answer some of those on our Twitter feed, which is uh, hashtag expert chat. If you go on to hashtag expert chat, you'll see some of those answers to questions that we didn't have time to get through. Thanks very much. This is Gavin Sirkin, Editorial Director for On Frontiers. Thanks for listening. <laughs>